we have at the Washington Institute, as I think most of you recognize, uh, the strongest, deepest uh, group of scholars working on Iran, which is, of course, the top priority for the United States in the region uh, at the moment. And as, uh, as we were thinking about in advance of this conference, you know, what, should we hold a panel on Iran or not? I, I think that it's easy to get sort of a uh, little bit of Iran fatigue because we keep hearing, well, maybe this is the year that Israel or the U.S. strikes. Maybe it's next year. Maybe the timeline is six months. Uh, it's easy to get kind of jaded about it. But one thing I, I, uh, I want everyone to realize is, is there's a lot more going on than just nuclear timelines uh, and the question about whether there's going to be a strike. And so we have three experts uh, who will bring out these other elements uh, of what's happening in Iran, uh, as well as talk about uh, all the other matters of concern. So Iran's got presidential elections coming up on June 14th. Uh, now, um, Iran's president is not particularly important in its foreign policy. He's not in, in charge of the military. He's not in charge of the Ministry of Intelligence. Uh, he, in fact, does not have say over the appointment of the most, uh, most important ambassadors. Uh, but the election of the president has been used by the man who really does call the shots, the supreme leader, as an important signaling device to indicate what direction he's headed in. And so uh, it's worth paying attention uh, to what happens with this presidential election. Uh, well, three of the last four presidential elections in Iran have produced surprises. And so, therefore, it would not be a surprise if this one were a surprise. <laughs> um, and uh, it, both in, uh, excuse me, 1997 and 2005 and in 2009, the anti-establishment candidate did very well. So in 1997, it was the reformist uh, Mohammad Khatami who won. It was 2005, there was the very clever move by uh, Ahmadinejad to paint himself as this populist anti-establishment candidate and to point out that his opponent, especially Hashmi Rasimjani, the former president, uh, was the quintessential man of the, can uh, of the establishment. Uh, there was a, a really clever campaign ad that Ahmadinejad ran on television in which uh, it panned around the uh, house of the former mayor of Tehran, who was thrown in jail for corruption. And uh, you saw his beautiful jacuzzi and his wonderful swimming pool, his nice yards. And then they interviewed Ahmadinejad's kid, who they lived in a very simple house. And they said, you know, where's the jacuzzi? Jacuzzi? We got one bathroom, right? Um, so anyway, uh, that, and then in 2009 as well, the anti-establishment candidates, the Greens, did very well. Uh, so the, those elections, there was a real ideological component uh, to uh, the campaign, and the Supreme Leader is determined not to allow that to happen. So in this election, what is likely is that the, um, uh, the famous candidates from the reformists and from the populist Ahmadinejad clone types are not going to be allowed to run, but probably somebody obscure from those camps will be allowed to run uh, in order to encourage people of that bent to actually show up and vote. Uh, in particular, there are local and village elections going to be held at the same time as the presidential elections, and there are a lot of reformist and populist candidates running for those posts. Uh, some of them are likely to make it in, especially the ones who are not well known and therefore not necessarily going to be a, a threat to uh, the more uh, hardline establishment types. Uh, the establishment people uh, have a whole bunch of pygmies running. And it's not clear which one of them is going to win. They're all obscure. Uh, well, almost all obscure. Uh, and so uh, whoever's going to be the winner, it's going to be a surprise. Uh, these guys don't differ very much in ideology. So what they're doing instead is getting real personal. And if you like salacious gossip, this is a great election campaign. Right? <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of details about the corruption, which is really pretty amazing. Um, they're, one of Ahmadinejad's guys... Um, Oops, turns out he stole 350 million euros. Well, that's a piker. Uh, the big guy, um, the, the, the big guy had stole uh, the case that came out uh, that caught everyone's attention last year uh, was about, was just somewhere around one and a half billion dollars. Um, one of the uh, people involved that had the uh, bank manager one of the largest banks, he had good taste to have, uh, or the good sense, to have acquired Canadian citizenship, and he showed up in Toronto. And, um. Now, one of the issues being debated, interestingly enough, is nuclear policy. 
We sometimes hear that, the, that nobody talks about the nuclear policy in Iran. Uh, I have three books in Persian that have been published in the last two years about the nuclear policy. Right? So it's not true they don't debate it. And in fact, the deputy, uh, Bagheri, the deputy of the current negotiator, gave a talk at Tehran University uh, last week in which he had these PowerPoint presentation about the mistakes of the previous team. Right? Um, and can you imagine if somebody in the U.S. government got up there and you know, gave a PowerPoint presentation about what my predecessors got wrong? I mean, that was kind of, you know, not very diplomatic. But, it, but the two positions, basically the position uh, of the previous team is that, that uh, there's now needless confrontation because we could get everything we wanted if we just smiled and talked to the West. Uh, this is the Ross and Johnny approach, which is blow smoke in your enemy's eyes, don't spit at them. And then the other position is that concessions brought no benefit and forced Iran to suspend its program, and that resistance let Iran continue with its program. Um, and sure, there's sanctions, but there would be sanctions anyway. So the, in this debate, the one thing they both agree upon is we will keep going with the program. The question is how best to deal with the West while we keep going with the program. But the nuclear issue is a, ah, it's a side issue. The main thing is the economy. And here, Ahmadinejad turned out to be very useful for the establishment because he can be blamed for the economic problems. So in the last few weeks, we've seen Iranian television has a new genre that uh, is coming to dominate the airwaves, uh, which is kind of like a crossfire, um, which is you get two people up there shouting at each other, one of whom is an articulate and thoughtful critic of Ahmadinejad, and the other is a bumbling idiot defending Ahmadinejad. Right? Um, <laughs> But the main theme of all of this is that all the economic problems are due to him, which is a nice way of saying it's not due to the sanctions. And it is true that uh, many of his policies were remarkably stupid, uh, although not all of them, uh, and that, in fact, his economic policy record has been okay. Uh, he's done some smart things, like reforming the subsidies, although he did it in a bad way. Um, and the reality is that it, precisely because the price of oil started soaring when he became president in 2005, uh, the country's economy did really quite nicely from 2005 through 2011. Uh, Iran's economic growth from 2005 to 2011 every year was substantially higher than that of the United States. And it ran a budget surplus every year. Um, and that uh, it's really kind of hard for us to go to Iranians and say, look, you should have had a world record boom in the last eight years, but instead what you've had is, okay, economic performance. And by the way, your economy has now slipped into recession, uh, but, you know, it's not been a, that dramatic. Uh, and the one thing which has been kind of dramatic has been uh, the collapse of the currency. Uh, well, you know, They've been running inflation at 10 to 15 percent a year for the last eight years, and they hadn't changed their exchange rate. That doesn't work so well. And, and the fact is that uh, the currency had become badly overvalued, which meant that imported goods were very cheap, and things made at home couldn't compete. So from an economic perspective, it made excellent sense to have the currency collapse. Now, that's not why the currency collapsed. The currency collapsed because people got spooked, ordinary Iranians got spooked, about uh, the nuclear situation and the sanctions, and, and uh, that's why the currency collapsed. But frankly, it hasn't been so bad for the Iranian economy from a long-term perspective uh, because it's helping producers. Uh, I mean, the pistachio farmers are delighted, for instance, that uh, they're getting a lot more money for their pistachios. And it's also helped the government budget. Because the government, after all, earns all this foreign exchange from oil sales, and then now it's able to get a lot more reals, the local currency, for its oil. Uh, so from a long-term perspective, the collapse of the currency has actually been pretty good for Iran. But it imposes an enormous amount of pain, and a lot of a pain in this transition, at the same time that the removal of the subsidies did the same thing. So while it's a good thing to remove the energy subsidies, it's kind of painful to have to pay four times as much for gasoline and to pay five times as much for electricity and for natural gas. Uh, and therefore, um, the economy is suffering, uh, especially the inflation. You know, the, a populist government like that of Ahmadinejad doesn't really want to force people to pay the prices for these changes. And so therefore, their solution has been to allow producers to pass on price increases, and that's contributed to inflation. And, and, and they've adopted a very accommodating monetary policy. Uh, 
And certainly, the sanctions, therefore, have contributed to these existing problems and have gotten more credit, more responsibility assigned to the sanctions than than may actually be due to them. Uh, I have often said that if you can find a way to get credit for the sunrise in the east, do it. Uh, And indeed, what's happening with our sanctions is that uh, uh, we are hitting Iran hard, uh, much harder than I expected we'd be able to. We've been able to cut Iran's oil exports in half. Um, and that's a loss of 40 to $50 billion a year. Uh, but um, uh, the problems of Iran's economy are, are frankly due in good part to domestic policy problems and not just to the sanctions. And by the way, just to be to highlight the, what it is we're talking about here, the fact is that even with uh, cutting Iran's oil exports in half, the country still runs a substantial balance of trade surplus. Um, I would say that the great triumph of U.S. sanctions policy is that we have proven to Iran over the last eight years that we were not sanctioned out, that we always had additional measures that we could impose, and that both the previous U.S. administration and the current one have been very skillful at showing that we can get additional measures and that we can keep making life tougher and tougher for Iran, and that uh, this has been uh, very helpful in saying to the Iranians that the pain is only going to get worse the longer this nuclear impasse continues. And we are not out of ideas. Uh, The proposal, the bipartisan proposal in the Senate the other day, for instance, about how to block Iran's access to its foreign exchange reserves is a good example of another very significant pain that we can inflict on Iran and probably are going to. And that, frankly, we've been quite successful at achieving a broad international consensus in favor of doing these things. And we've been helped a lot about this by the Iranians. Because as we impose sanctions on the Iranians, uh, they engage in illicit transactions, which we can then point out violate whole kinds of international agreements. Uh, And uh, a good example of this is in shipping. When when we started taking action against Iranian shipping, the Iranians responded by having their ships turn off the uh, monitors, the, the, the transponders which show where ships are, and that's a violation of all kinds of insurance regulations and uh, uh, international safety regulations. So we could get their ships banned from ports because they're violating safety regulations. Um, so, yes, our sanctions have been tough and imposing pain on Iran, but at least so far, uh, the attitude of Iran's leaders is that, the, that they're prepared to bear the pain. Um, and uh, the new Iranian budget, for instance, uh, has a considerable reduction in additional reduction in subsidies, a considerable additional reduction in civil service salaries, at least 20 percent. And if they're prepared to impose that kind of pain on their people, and if they can get away with it, because at least so far, uh, the Islamic Republic has a very sophisticated system to block pop- popular protests. Uh, and if they can get away with this, uh, then uh, we have a real political problem. Uh, and certainly, the supreme leader, is every instinct is to resist. And this argument that you hear about the nuclear program, which is to say there's no reason to compromise because even if we compromised, we'd get nothing. That's his every instinct, his every instinct. And if we ever do get a nuclear deal, it will be against his better judgment, and he'll be unhappy with it. In fact, in these debates about what happened in the nuclear discussions, one of the things which comes out is it turns out that the Supreme Leader advised against every compromise that Iran has made over the last decade. And in each case, he told these people, well, okay, you can go ahead and do it, but I don't think it's a good idea. And I think that if we ever get another nuclear compromise, that will again be his attitude. Good morning. I've only had three cups of coffee, so I'm not going to stand up. I'm going to sit here. (laughs) Last night we heard, I think it was David Sanger who said that he hears some people in the administration use the term, you know, a light footprint. Um, Well, Iran's much the same, uh, and they like to engage in things uh, abroad internationally targeting us and our allies uh, that they can do with reasonable deniability. The result is that largely over tensions over the nuclear program, but other things as well as we'll discuss, there is now a real shadow war between Iran and the West um, in which Iran is extremely aggressive. And this is something which is complicated for us, not only in the United States, across multiple administrations of every flavor, but in the West in general, because we tend to be risk-averse when it comes to Iran. And Iran, so long as it can do things with reasonable deniability, tends to be pretty aggressive. So wrap your heads around this. A year ago, February, 
A guy runs out of a house in Bangkok with blood coming out of his ears, holding two big things in his hands. A taxi cab drives down the street, already has a passenger, so he's not stopping. Probably wouldn't have stopped anyway because there's a strange guy waving his hands wildly and blood coming out of his ears. The cab doesn't stop, so the guy throws one of his objects at the cab. It turns out to be a sticky bomb, one of these magnetic bombs. Nearly blows up the car, injures the two people. Everything's happening so quickly, people come to this guy's defense. The bomb just went off, he's got blood coming out of his ears, maybe he's injured. So he throws the other sticky bomb at them, but at this point he's so weak it just falls in front of his own feet and blows off his own legs. And this is a Quds Force officer in Bangkok who is preparing sticky bombs for an attack presumably targeting Israeli diplomats, though it could have been others because there have been Quds Force attacks targeting American diplomats, our ambassador, other members of the diplomatic staff, members of their families in Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, British diplomats in Africa, Uh, Two Saudi diplomats have already been killed, a whole host of activities around the world. And it's all the more incredible, this story, because you'd think that the Quds Force, if they were, and apparently they were active in Thailand, that they would have been trying hard to stay under the radar, because at that very moment, the CIA, the FBI, the local authorities, everybody was focused on Bangkok, because just a week and a half earlier, a European Hezbollah operative, Hussein Atras, a dual Lebanese-Swedish citizen, was arrested right there in Bangkok because he was targeting Israeli tourists in places where all the tourists go, which is why the U.S. Embassy issued warnings for American tourists as well, and then led Thai authorities to his safe house north of town where he was putting together chemical precursors and crystallizing them into explosives and shipping them around the world in packages marked as kitty litter, including to South America and other places. So people are a little bit focused on Bangkok and Despite that, the Quds Force is in their safe house putting together sticky bombs for an attack. The fact is, it's even more amazing than that. The Quds Force, which we usually associate with being 10 feet tall, extremely capable, people refer to Iran, and even their proxy, Hezbollah, as being the A-team of terrorism, and they refer to Hezbollah as the A-team. Why? Because they get this training from who? From Iran. Here, Iran is apparently nincompoops. As we began to investigate, we found that there were a whole host of plots that were uh, involved with this the small group of people. Um, two people were tasked with putting together a new unit within the Quds Force, Unit 400. One of them is someone who'd already been designated by the Treasury Department for the activities he was engaged in targeting coalition forces in Iraq. And the other was someone that we knew about because we first came across him in Los Angeles, where he was targeting uh, Iranian dissidents, including one dissident who was running an online radio program that probably had, you know, a dozen listeners or so, but was saying particularly egregious things against the regime. And so he either got orders or he decided to assassinate this person. But he wasn't a particularly sharp knife in the operational drawer because he decided that he'd have to rent a car and drive the guy over because it was just too difficult to get a firearm in Los Angeles. (laughs) Were it only so. He then turns up in London where he's doing much the same, and uh, there's a long history of Quds Force incompetence being promoted. He gets promoted to be one of the two heads of this Unit 400, and he's the one who personally goes out and does the pre-operational surveillance for Quds Force plots in Baku, Azerbaijan, the country, not the state of Georgia, India, Thailand, and in all of those places uses the same SIM card. Take my word for it as the deputy chief of one of our U.S. intelligence agencies until I came back to the Institute. That's a gift from heaven. If we weren't aware of him already, we probably became aware of him. And then we find out that when he sent his people to Thailand for this operation that wasn't discovered and thwarted but was failed because they, the bomb they were putting together in their safe house blew up and the blood came out of his ears and blah, blah, blah. Once he blew off his own legs, it didn't take law enforcement very long to figure out where, where they came into the country, at a beach resort, to go down to the beach resort, figure out what hotel the guy was staying in, what bar he was hanging out in. And it turns out that he was hanging out with some prostitutes at a local water pipe uh, bar. Uh, and worse than the operational security failure of hanging out with prostitutes is that he let the prostitutes take pictures of them. Come here. With the cell phone. I'm not calling you a prostitute. Um, <laughs> And that's how we found out. Uh, we're just good friends. Yeah. That's how we found out about his two uh, uh, compatriots, one of whom was then arrested at the airport in Bangkok. 
The other was arrested at the airport in Kuala Lumpur, and there was no surprise about Kuala Lumpur because another aspect of their poor operational security is that they were all entering Southeast Asia through Malaysia. Now, if you're an Iranian tourist or businessman, that's a, that's a no-brainer because there's no visa requirement from Iran to go to Malaysia. But if you're an undercover operative, maybe you want to mix it up a little bit just so that we know that there's more than one airport we have to surveil. <laughs> so how is it that these guys were so incompetent? How is it, in fact, that not only them, but that Hezbollah, too? Failure after failure after failure after failure until Burgas, Bulgaria. Ever since February 2008, when Imad Mugnia was assassinated, Hezbollah has been trying to carry out a revenge attack targeting a senior, current, or former Israeli official, kidnapping plots in Africa, southern Europe, plots in Baku, Azerbaijan, in Egypt. In September 2009, Hezbollah plotted an attack in Turkey, one of three attacks in Turkey. And here they said, listen... We're a little rusty. Iran, Quds Force, give us a little more operational support than you usually do. And the Quds Force said, fine. And they still failed. And so at this point in late 2009, you have this odd situation where the Quds Force and Hezbollah are kind of yelling at each other. Quds Force is saying, Hezbollah used to be really good, and now, well, you're not. And Hezbollah is saying, you know, if you really cared about Mugnia, and reportedly you did, then you'd help us if you think we're not as good as we once were. This whole debate is put to rest not because they resolve it as such, but because in January 2010, as part of this shadow war, somebody assassinates with a sticky bomb in the streets of Tehran, Professor Mohammadi, one of the more important professors involved in Iran's nuclear program. And Iran goes basically apoplectic over the optics of their inability to protect their key people at home. And they call in the Quds Force, and they call in Hezbollah, and they slap their hand down on the table and say, this is how it's going to be. You will carry out reprisal attacks, and you will do it now. And the bottom line, therefore, is that when you're asked to cut corners and you're asked to trade trade craft, which is slow and methodical, for speed, do it now, you're going to be a little more sloppy. And that's what happened, plot after plot. We can't sit back on our laurels, though, and assume that that will continue to be the case because we've already seen them return to trade craft, especially at Hezbollah, slowly recruiting people who have grown up in the West, who have foreign passports, who who speak foreign languages, who operate import-export companies or other types of businesses that would logically give them a reason to travel abroad. When we look at the case of Husam Yakub, the second Swedish Hezbollah operative to be arrested in six months, just six months after this guy was arrested in Thailand, Husam Yakub is arrested in Cyprus. He's since been tried and convicted in Cyprus for carrying out surveillance of Israeli tourists there. He was recruited not in 2010 when Iran said, do this and do it now. He was recruited not in 2008 when Mugnia was assassinated and they decided it was time to carry out avenge attacks. He was recruited already in 2007, and they didn't speed things up with him and presumably some others, slowly training him, first in the basements of Beirut apartment buildings and operational security. Then when they felt he was ready, sending him on test missions, his word, missions, not mine, taking an envelope saying, don't ask what it is, don't open it, but you're going to go to Antalya, Turkey. You'll deliver it to a guy who will spot you based on the clothing you'll wear. When he approaches you, he'll say the following words. You'll say the following words back. Then and only then give him the package. Then vacation in Turkey for two days. If anybody asks, that's what you were doing. And apparently he did very well. Presumably his Bala guys were watching him because not long after he came back, he was promoted to getting actual military training and he listed out for the uh, police in, in Cyprus all the different weapon systems that he was trained on. And then and only then was he given two more training missions to deliver packages to Hezbollah operatives in different places in the world. And one of the reasons the Europeans are having such a hard time now ignoring Hezbollah and that this is being forced upon their plate is not just because of Bulgaria, which was a Hezbollah plot in Europe that killed a European along with Israelis, and not just because of Cyprus, where a, where a European Hezbollah operative has been convicted by a European court, not based on intelligence, but based on open source law enforcement information that went through full judicial scrutiny and cross-examination, but because among the things that that same operative was tasked to do before he went to Cyprus, these training missions to provide materials to Hezbollah operatives elsewhere in the world, where was that? Where might Hezbollah have operatives that need things delivered? In Lyon, France, and in Amsterdam. Hezbollah is clearly doing things in Western Europe, which is causing them a tremendous amount of angst. I'm going back 
to Brussels in a couple of weeks. Over the past few months, I've been in seven European countries, plus Brussels, arguing with them. And it's having an impact. In fact, just yesterday, while we were sitting here, there was a debate in the House of Commons in London on this very issue. And one of the people who was arguing the side that we are promoting specifically cited by name the Washington Institute and two of our studies. So this is, this is having an impact. As this is happening, and as Iran is telling uh, the Quds Force and Hezbollah to get their act together and do things, one of these two individuals who's heading up the Quds Force Unit 400, the one that we had designated for his activities in, in Iraq back in the day a couple of years ago, his cousin comes home to visit. His cousin is disgruntled. His wife just left, left him. His used car business in Texas is going down the toilet. Even his criminal enterprises south of the border in Mexico aren't going so well. So he figures he'll go home and visit his family. But it turns out one member of his family, his cousin, is this Quds Force general. And from the Quds Force general's perspective, just as he gets the directive to start targeting the West, including the United States, a disgruntled cousin from Texas comes home and says that he has connections to uh, the, the, the Mexican uh, cartels and could, if they wanted, help find an assassin. And they put together a plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador here in Washington, D.C., which is a crazy plot that seems like it's written in crayon, but if you put it into the context of this, this push that the Iranians are saying, do it and do it now, it makes all the sense in the world. Luckily for us, the guy didn't have connections to the Mexican cartels. The person that he thought was his cartel uh, connection was actually a Drug Enforcement Administration source. <laughs> and it's funny, but it's not. Had it not been a source, this might have turned out very differently. Iran had already transferred $150,000 as a down payment for this assassination. So there's a lot going on. And the fact that Iran and Hezbollah were engaged in poor tradecraft for some time does not mean that that will necessarily continue to be the case. Just over the past weeks, there have been Quds Force plots um, made public in Bulgaria involving a Canadian woman, in Spain, where they were again targeting dissidents, and then most recently in Bosnia, in places that you really wouldn't have thought of uh, otherwise. This is something that if you look around at the media, if you Google it, if you look at the literature, if you look at everyone in this town and elsewhere, there's no one that is doing the kind of work that we're doing on this. And it's getting appreciated because this is something that is on the very front burner for U.S. intelligence and law enforcement. Uh, as one senior official put it to me, when the president gets briefed on counterterrorism issues on a daily basis, it is no longer in the least bit strange if among the top three things that he gets briefed on, one, two, or sometimes even three of them are not al-Qaeda or Sunni extremist cases, but Iran, Quds Force, Hezbollah, or other Shia extremist cases. And but with concluding, I just, I just want to say this. One of the reasons we at the Washington Institute, despite being a fairly small shop, are able to do the incredible work that we do is because we have an amazing uh, array of research assistants and interns. Uh, and among the people who have doing, been doing fantastic work in support of me and others on this are uh, Gieve and Jonathan and Melissa over there. And I just want to say publicly thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, and now Mike Eisenstadt with more cheery news for you. Well, that's a hard act to follow, and I'm going to have to tell you that I'm not going to talk about prostitutes or bars or, or boobs. I think you use that word, Patrick, boobs, right? I don't know. So anyhow, um, this is um, kind of uh, um, uh, le less, less exciting and titillating, but what I'm going to be talking about – oh, there I go again um, – <laughs> What I'm going to be talking about is um, based on a paper that's going to be coming out in a few weeks, which looks at how the United States can use uh, the military instrument and, and intelligence and information activities to bolster diplomacy with Iran, because we've been involved in this diplomatic process um, with the um, Islamic Republic for several years now. Um, we've, in the last uh, little over a year now, we've had in, enhanced sanctions, and, and basically sanctions have been kind of the policy instrument of choice for the United States uh, for a long time in dealing with Iran. Um, and so we've kind of doubled down on sanctions, but um, thus far there's been no indication that, while there's no doubt, as Patrick explained, that the sanctions have had a dramatic impact on the Iranian economy, there's no indication that they have altered Iran's um, uh, threat calculus or risk calculus with regard to uh, or cost-benefit calculus um, in the way it thinks about its nuclear program. So we've not seen any alteration 
any significant alteration in Iran's negotiating uh, position. The only thing that's happened actually is the P5 plus one position has kind of uh, modified a little bit in the hope of kind of uh, providing, uh, in the hope that those moves closer to the Iranian position will cause them to move uh, to reciprocate, and that hasn't happened thus far. Um, we, now, we, the United States has been using for several years um, various uh, military and intelligence uh, and informational instruments vis-a-vis the Islamic Republic. But my argument is that a lot of what we are doing has not accounted for the way that Iran looks at the things we're doing. And therefore, the things we are doing in the military and similar domains, by and large, are not having the um, intended results. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples of the things that previous administrations and this administration have been doing and um, how, I, how I believe they are being seen in Tehran. And they fall into the category of, first, strengthening partnerships with our allies in the region, second, reinforcing and, um, our forces in the region and filling gaps in our military capabilities there, the drawing of red lines, um, and then the conduct of a sabotage, uh, cyber spying, and offensive cyber warfare campaign. Now, let me go over each of these in turn and kind of uh, parse this a little bit further. And the first I mentioned was strengthening partnerships. We've been working on, um, in, in, in particular, we, we've been working on strengthening the military capabilities of many of our Gulf allies in recent years. Um, there are a number of multi-billion dollar contracts that have been, for weapons that have been signed with these countries, actually worth tens of billions of dollars with the Saudis, with the UAE, with Kuwait, and the like. And the idea, one of the things we're trying to accomplish by these arms sales is to send the message to Tehran that if you continue on your current path, it will simply spur your neighbors to build up their conventional capabilities, and that actually, rather than enhancing your security posture in the Gulf, your nuclear program will actually undermine your security posture, but you'll be surrounded by a bunch of Gulf states that have very large, capable milita- militaries. The problem, from my point of view with that, is that, by and large, Iran tends to be very dismissive. They, they tend to look at their Ar- Arab Gulf neighbors with contempt and be very dismissive of their military capabilities. So um, a lot of what we're trying to do in this area, first of all, I think is... is you know, does, runs against the grain of Iran's kind of ingrained, you know, perceptions of their, their neighbors. Um, secondly, um, the, um, the, 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 forgive me, I've just lost my train of thought here, but I'm going to, I'll go on. That, um, the second thing we've been doing is, um, oh, the other thing is that the main threat that Iran uh, poses to its neighbors um, is not in the conventional military arena. Um, it's likely in, in the areas of subversion and the like. And as a result, the, um, they're not going to give their Gulf neighbors um, a pretext to respond by using conventional military capabilities. They're going to operate, as Matt talked about a moment ago, they're likely going to operate um, in the shadows um, by using uh, proxies and the like um, in a way that makes it very hard for those countries to use their conventional military capabilities. And then finally, the, the Iranians... The whole narrative that they've been coming out with with regard to um, the Arab Spring is that this, the Arab Spring is actually an Islamic awakening. That's the, that's the term that they use it. Uh, that's how they describe the Arab Spring. A belated response to the inspirational impact of the Islamic Revolution in, in Iran in the Arab world. That's, that's how they, they, they portray the Arab Spring. And therefore, from their point of view, the arms that are being accumulated in these Arab Gulf states really in the long run won't um, um, pose a threat to Iran because just as the Shah's military, you know, we, we, we sold billions of dollars of arms to the Shah and he was swept away, away by an Islamic revolution um, and, and all these arms were inherited by the Islamic Republic, likewise all the arms we're selling in the Gulf will be in, eventually inherited by Islamic uh, regimes in these countries that will basically share a general worldview with the Islamic Republic. Maybe they won't be close allies, but they won't pose a threat to the Islamic Republic in the hands of Islamist regimes. 
So what we're trying to do by selling arms to our Gulf allies really, I don't think, is having the intended effect in terms of altering their threat perception and altering Iran's calculus in terms of the costs of its nuclear program. The second thing we're doing um, has to do with re reinforcing our military presence in the region and filling gaps in our capabilities. And I won't go into all the details here, but I'll give you an example of one of the things we've done in recent years and how um, I, I, th I don't think it's had exactly the effect that we intended. One of the things we did, we, we've had aircraft carriers in the Gulf for about uh, 20 years now, s since the eve of the, the Gulf War in 1991. Um, and for the last three years, we've actually ratcheted up our presence, and we've had two carriers in the vicinity of the Gulf most of the time. One of the aircraft carriers is in the Arabian Sea, supporting operations in Afghanistan, and the other carrier generally was inside the Persian Gulf, um, from our point of view, kind of de providing deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iranian adventurism and uh, sending a message to Tehran that, you know, don't, don't mess with us because we have the ability to, you know, to, to strike uh, hard at you. The problem is they've been, as I just mentioned, they've been living with an aircraft carrier steaming off their coast on and off for 20 years now. During the time in which you had Hobart Towers, you know, the, uh, the uh, Iranian-sponsored terrorist attack against American Air Force personnel in Saudi Arabia, during, during the time that we had carriers off the, off the coast of Iran, they were supplying IEDs, you know, improvised explosive devices to Iran, Iranian-supported special groups in um, Iraq. Um, and then you had this plot to assassinate uh, the Saudi ambassador in the United States. And yet the carriers never once launched aircraft against Iran in anger. So I'm not sure, you know, I, 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 I suspect they would prefer that there not be a carrier in the Gulf. We, we, know they want them, we, they, we know they want the U.S. Navy out of the Gulf. But the fact that it's there, I'm not sure, you know, um, is, is something which has given them great pause because they've been able to do all these things without, you know, the carrier striking, you know, being used in any military operations or any military response. Plus, the fact that the carrier is in the Gulf and so close to the Iranian coast um, means that they have the ability to hold at risk one of our strategic assets. We only have, I think, 11 carriers now in our Navy, or 10 or 11. And um, they have a lot of very highly capable military systems in the Gulf. And I think in the event of a conflict, it was very likely that, a carrier, that the carrier there would have probably been damaged. Not sunk, but, but damaged. And they would have been the, be able to claim a psych, uh, propaganda victory as the first country since World War II that was able to bloody a U.S. aircraft carrier in combat. So actually, having the carrier there, I'm not sure really accomplished what we thought we were accomplishing by having it there. There are arguments about why it's, better, it's, it's good to have a carrier inside the Gulf and outside the Gulf in the event of a war with Iran. But in terms of you know, what we refer to as coercive diplomacy, I'm not sure the carrier really accomplished its objective. And therefore, I didn't really bemoan the fact that we were not uh, deploying the second carrier back to the Gulf in February because of sequestration problems, although I had problems with the way that the administration rolled this out, that it had to do with, you know, sequestration, um, and that which kind of presented, uh, uh, you know, kind of actually fed the Iranian narrative that the U.S. is a power in decline because of our economic problems. And I would have preferred, you know, there were obviously domestic political reasons the administration did that, but, uh, uh, to, you know, to blame the, you know, the Republicans in Congress. But... Um, and it was, it was in that context. But I would have preferred that we, you know, provided a different reason for the, the decision not to deploy the carrier. The third area is red lines I mentioned before. Now, the Israelis have put out red lines, which have to do with the amount of um, low-enriched uranium to 20 percent that the Iranians are producing. Our red line is um, that um, Iran should not, you know, develop a nuclear weapon. The problem is both those red lines don't really interfere with what I believe Iranian, the Iranians are trying to accomplish right now. Um, even if the Iranians don't cross the Israeli red line, they are still producing, very, uh, with regard to 20 percent, they are producing large quantities of 3.5 percent right now yeah, in rich uranium. And the stuff that they're producing to 20 percent and converting it to um, um, fuel plates, uh, only Heinen will, you know, as, as you know, he will tell you, can be converted very quickly back to 20 percent anyhow. So in a way, and, and, and my, my feeling was that Whereas in the past, the Iranian gold before their, before their enrichment facilities at Natanz and Fordow were discovered in 2002 and 2009, I think their, pro, their, their goal was to have a clandestine nuclear program to secretly produce nuclear weapons. Once they got discovered, I think their goals changed. And I think their goal now is simply to build up very large quantities of low-enriched uranium and advanced centrifuges. 
And in order to uh, obtain a situation of what I call nuclear deterrence without the bomb. In other words, if you have very large quantities of LEU, low enriched uranium on hand, and, and if it's kept in very secure places, even if it gets bombed, not all of it will be destroyed. And if you have very large numbers of, of centrifuges, even if they get bombed, not all of them will be destroyed. We know that from Germany and Japan in World War II, from our studies of bombing industrial facilities. And that will leave them with the ability to, even after a bombing campaign, to resurrect their program relatively quickly should they decide to do, decide to do so. So, so my, my concern is neither of the red lines that either the Israelis or the United States have established really prevent the Iranians from achieving their near-term ob objectives with regard to their nuclear program. Now, the one area that I think we have had some success has to do with sabotage and, and, and cyber spying and offensive cyber uh, operations. Again, not a lot of information in the public domain in this area, but it seems that the, the net effect of all the things we've been doing for several years now in this regard has been to delay Iran's program for several years. But we've, we're reaching a point now where we're kind of uh, reaching a point of diminishing returns with regard to a lot of these operations, at least so it seems based on what's in the public domain. The Iranians, because of the fact that Stuxnet kind of leaked out into the civilian system and they had some you know, very good you know, foreign um, you know, uh, cybersecurity experts look at it, they're now aware of the problem. And once you're aware of the problem, you can start taking measures to counteract it, although it's always, you know, it's always a kind of a tug of war between those who innovate new, new methods and new measures and then those who are playing catch-up to discover what they are. So I, I don't know where we are in this regard in terms of the measure-countermeasure kind of uh, battle. But the bottom line is it seems like we've reached a point of diminishing returns with regard to some of the sabotage operations. Um, the assassination of Iranian scientists, it's hard to know for instance, what impact that had on the nuclear program. I, I, I have to believe it did have a disruptive impact. But there's not been an assassination now for over a year. I, and I think that was, my, my speculation is that was in the context of U.S.-Israeli uh, tensions. That, you know, and this brings me to the, kind of the next point I want to discuss, and I'll discuss it very briefly, but I want to get to the Q&A, which has to do with the um, shadow wars that Matt mentioned. Matt talked about one aspect of the shadow wars that have been going on, but actually the shadow wars and the, and the covert campaigns that have been going on between the U.S. On, and its allies on one hand, and Iran and its allies on the other hand, really encompass a very broad uh, range of a uh, areas. Terrorism, cyber, UAV operations, unmanned aerial vehicle operations, and, and we've intensified these operations over Iran and its, around its periphery in, in recent years, and they've been pushing back uh, once trying to shoot down Amer an American UAV in the Gulf, the other time threatening it but being chased off by American combat aircraft. Um, the Saudis and the Qataris and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the Turks are supplying the opposition in Syria. So Syria is one venue of these kind of, you know, where it's maybe not, it's not really a war in the shadow. It's almost an overt kind of, you know, competition. The, pro the, the problem is there's all of these efforts, some of them are unilateral, there are things that America is doing on its own, some things we're doing with our allies. There are things that the Israelis are doing on their own, and some they're doing with us. All the lines between all these covert campaigns are being blurred now. And as a result, there's a heightened potential for these conflicts to jump kind of um, the, the tracks. And, that, and I'll give you an example of what I mean. You had the attempted uh, or the planned assassination of the Saudi ambassador in Washington, I believe, was in response to the Saudi intervention in Bahrain in, in March of 2011 in order to repress the, uh, the Shiite opposition there. And the Iranians responded with an action in the United States. So in other words, we got sucked into, you know, the kind of the Saudi-Iranian, you know, shadow war. And likewise, I think, you know, the, um, the planned attack on American ambassador or diplomatic personnel in Azerbaijan was in part a response to the assassination campaign of Iranian scientists, which, as far as we know, it, it seems we were not involved in. It probably was an Israeli operation. So all these operations are starting to blur, and there's a heightened potential as a result of, of, of things getting out of control, which is why I think the administration has been very, I would argue, overly cautious in this area, despite the risks, and we've been very restrained in doing some things, which I think in the end, and this will be my final comment, a lot of the things that we are doing or that we're failing to do are sending the message to Iran that um, we are overly concerned and overly cautious um, in dealing with them, and we're overly concerned of doing things that can lead to, lead to an inadvertent conflict with Iran. And in, but in fact, that heightens the prospect for a, con a conflict with Iran because Iran then believes that they have 
greater freedom of, of maneuver. And as a result, I believe there's a heightened chance, because we see them pushing back actually harder than ever before, there's a heightened chance of an inadvertent conflict because of our desire to avoid such an inadvertent conflict. And I'll leave that as my final comment. Thank you. My final comment. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, and uh, if, uh, we're going to take questions, but before uh, I, I begin calling on you out here, I, I do want to do two things. One, I, I do want to uh, point out to you Ali Heinenen, who's sitting back here. Ali, you can wave. At, uh, um, Ali is a, a friend of the Institute, um, is one of the world's top experts on nuclear proliferation, <coughs> and was in charge of the inspections of Iran's nuclear facilities for the IAEA. So for those, those of you who have questions about uh, hexafluoride versus uranium oxide, or <laughs> what are the cafeterias like at Natanz, uh, Oli is your man. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was, you know, it's, uh, it, it is a pleasure to sit up here with these guys. You know, I mean, it's uh, one of the things I love about these conferences and about interacting with all of you and, and the scholars is how the Institute really feels like a family and we, it, it's a very kind of relaxed atmosphere. But uh, one thing I want you to realize is that these are, these are the same briefings, uh, maybe with a little bit less humor, uh, that uh, our scholars give in places, uh, just to name a recent few, like CENTCOM, SOCOM. Uh, our uh, naval base in the Gulf, um, the FBI, uh, testimony uh, before various uh, congressional committees uh, in the European Union where we're influencing, as Matt mentioned, the debate on whether or not to designate Hezbollah. In fact, it's easier in a sense to keep track of Iran's nuclear program, to keep track of everything these guys are doing and, and everywhere they're speaking. Um, and, uh, and that's just a tremendous, tremendous asset uh, for our government for governments around the world, uh, which again is, is really all due to your support, uh, for which we thank you, uh, because it makes it possible. So with that, uh, let's take questions. I, I have a couple questions that are kind of related uh, for Matt. So Matt, that was, uh, that, that all those stories you were, you were telling us sounded a little bit like a James Bond movie, uh, maybe a comedy version of a James Bond movie. That could Wait till you read the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could turn to a tragedy sometime soon. So my question is, with all these uh, covert operations taking place by, uh, by Hezbollah, by the Iranians, what are we doing in return? What, is, uh, what, is, uh, our, what do our covert operations look like? Uh, do we have a James Bond out there somewhere? And number two, kind of along the same lines, is, you know, we... In watching these James Bond-type movies where we're battling, we used to be battling the Russians, and everybody was very worried about the Russians and, you know, the, uh, 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 all, the, uh, all the back and forth between the U.S. and Russia. Nobody seems to be all that worried about Iran. Nobody seems to be taking them all that seriously among the general population. How do we get people in general to take this whole thing a little more seriously and to see, see it for, what, uh, for what's really going on? So. The honest answer to your question is that I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> uh, you know, as a former law enforcement intelligence person, it actually drives me crazy that there's so much available in the open source about Operation Olympic Games related to Stuxnet and Flame and some of the, the things that, that, that we're doing. Um, but the good news is that most of it isn't. I can also tell you in general terms that <clears throat> across administrations, you know, the people who are responsibility is to think these things through are professionals who don't identify themselves as Republicans or Democrats, uh, and they do the job that has to be done. And there are lots of creative things that are thought, and, you know, people aren't sitting back and just being passive. Um, having said that, I do also believe what I said, which is that we tend to be risk averse, uh, especially compared to Iran and their uh, willingness to be aggressive. Um, and so in the balance, I think they are more aggressive than we are. That, is, that balance has changed somewhat over the past few years, to be sure. But the good news is we can't, we can't talk about the, all the, the 007, what are, what are we doing, uh, part of it. There's, there's lots that is being done. And, uh, and again, we heard from David Sanger, and it's very, very true, the administration um, it has a uh, preference for the light footprint type of thing, and some of that is, is pretty creative. I'll defer to my colleagues in part on, on how, to, how do we get the general population more motivated over this. 
Uh, look, we spent a lot of time on this, and it's one of the reasons why we don't only brief to CENTCOM and FBI and Congress. Uh, we also spend a lot of time on college campuses and uh, adv advocacy groups and all kinds of other places to try and make people aware. Uh, and a lot of media, as you saw in the incredible video that, uh, that our staff put together, uh, to increase awareness of these issues. Um, and doing that in a way that doesn't scream fire in the movie theater is important because you tend to have people who think that there's nothing going on here or, you know, Iran is trying to drop a bomb on Washington right now. Uh, serious discussion about this that raises awareness is far and few between, and I think it's one of the things that, that we do well. Patrick? Yeah, I think we ought to take, make more use of Iran's aggressiveness. Um, the diplomacy is not going very well. And yet it's extremely difficult for a president of the United States or a prime minister of Israel to stand up there and explain why it was okay for Iran to have 239 kilos of 20% enriched uranium, but 240 kilos? Mm -mm. We've got to start a war. That's not very credible. And I think that even if Dennis and Elliot are right, that this president is determined that Iran not get a nuclear weapons capability, I don't see any good way to initiate a crisis. And there I think Iran's aggressiveness is a blessing in disguise. And my attitude is if the nuclear negotiations have stalemated, the next time we find an Arbab's yard trying to blow up the restaurant on my block, let him do it. I, I, I want to say I agree with that. <laughs> In a friendly way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> to, to which my analytical response is, oi. Right. <laughs> look, I, I think it's well, important look, I mean, to mention. I mean, right. look, frankly, that's the way we've usually gotten into wars, right? Uh, I, I mean, President Lincoln didn't call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked. But he did order the commander of Fort Sumter to do exactly that, which the governor of South Carolina told him would cause the fort to be attacked. There is a long history doing that. And it's important to mention that the U.S. government has kind of changed its assessment and calculus of Iranian decision-making because of the Arab Obsir plot. You know, uh, those of us who have been in government can, can tell you how painful it is to get public testimonies, public statements approved by the interagency where someone at a very low level of government wants to move a comma or delete a sen you know, sentence. But the Director of National Intelligence has testified now multiple times that the Arab Sierra plot has changed our calculus, and we now believe that some Iranian decision makers, and I'm quoting, probably including Supreme Leader Khamenei, uh, no longer see the uh, uh, no longer see carrying out some type of attack in the United States as crossing some type of red line because of their real and perceived, uh, the actions that we actually are and the actions they are perceiving that we are, we are taking against them. If, can I just, just quickly? Sure, briefly. Um, the, actually, the, the, I think the biggest problem we face is a um, credibility deficit vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the way that our allies see us. And the, and the problem we face is that we've been basically socializing our adversary, in, the case of, in this case Tehran, to believe that for 30 years they can wage proxy warfare against us successfully without risking military response. Um, and that's a legacy of the Marine Barracks bombing and Hobart Towers and the Barb Sear affair and the like. Now, the way that people, as a result, you know, the way that people kind of say, how can we strengthen our credibility if we move our weapons and this and that to the region, this is not going to be solved by any kind of gim you know, gimmicks related to our force posture and the like. It has to do with the way that our leadership is, is perceived in the region and, and the way that um, our president is, is, is read by both our allies and, and our adversaries. And therefore, we have to begin a long-term process of kind of retraining or resocializing Iran by doing things, and I would argue things that are actually very um, low-key, but constantly ratcheting a pressure um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the shadow war against Tehran, but in, in a non-kinetic way. Because I, I argue that it's not in our interest for this to become an open conflict between the United States and Iran, that it's best kept um, in the shadows. But we need to start now in order by t you know, taking actions which indicate to Tehran that we are no longer, that we are um, no longer as risk averse as we've you know, indicated and signaled in the past. So, great. Dana. Yes, um, 
I'm not quite sure how relevant this question is, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I've been sort of waiting to ask it for two days now. And that is, um, can you just talk about the constellation of our relationships with our allies in Europe and how they impact our relations with Iran? I think it is stunning that Europe's in the middle of a, an economic crisis, if you haven't noticed, and Greece isn't doing so well. And yet, there is nobody, nobody in Europe or even in Greece who's proposing changing the ban on purchasing Iranian oil. Greece used to be the largest customer in Europe of Iranian oil, and the Iranians sold to them on very favorable credit terms. There's not that many people who lend money to Greece these days, and there is nobody in Greece proposing to going back to buying Iranian oil. So I got lots of complaints about the Europeans, they should be more da 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 but if you had told me two years ago that, that in the middle of the worst economic crisis that Europe has had in, in 80 years, that they would cut off purchase of Iranian oil, and this would not be a matter of any controversy in European circles, I would have said, whoa, we've got to be kidding. You know, I'll just add one comment about this. I'm, I realize I'm supposed to be moderating, but uh, one of the interesting developments over the last few years is that uh, some of our European allies have become, in a sense, more hard line than the United States. Uh, and they've been concerned about some of the things we've been willing to put forward on the table in the in negotiations and so forth. And so the dynamic has changed a bit. And uh, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing or will yield progress is open to debate. Um, but there's no doubt that, for example, the you know it's it's easy to forget that the socialist government of France has engaged uh, in now two military operations uh, in the Middle East in in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, there's they've uh, been engaged in. Libya, which obviously started under Sarkozy, as well as Mali. Uh, and so there's been a shift in that dynamic. More questions? Yes, Martin. That's you. I have a question about uh, Hezbollah. So um, Hezbollah is supposed to be a deterrent to keep Israel from attacking Iran. If Israel attacks Iran, that means the deterrent failed. So why is it, do you think that Hezbollah at that point is actually going to take action against Israel? Because I assume that once Israel makes this strategic political decision to attack Iran, if, if Hezbollah decides to go to war with Israel, Israel isn't going to fight them with one hand tied behind their back. They've already taken the international uh, criticism of starting one war, so they're going to really go after Hezbollah. So I'm wondering how Hezbollah reacts to that and how much control Iran really has on them. It's absolutely true that Iran uses Hezbollah in part as a deterrent against Israel. But they're much, much more than that. There's no question that if anybody attacks Iran, certainly the Israelis, but even if it's not Israel, uh, Iran will use its own uh, agents, Quds Force, etc., and others, especially Hezbollah, uh, to conduct uh, terrorist attacks, asymmetric warfare against Israel in the West. There's no question. Um, depending on the nature of the strike, who does it, uh, what's hit, how bad it is, you'll also have uh, rockets that are fired. The downside to that for them, whether it's Hezbollah or others, is that there's an address. Right? Um, but I don't think that if there's a strike on Iran, that therefore Hezbollah becomes irrelevant as a deterrent, um, because Hezbollah is also, it's much more than just trying to deter an attack on Iran. It's much more about uh, opposing Israel, uh, being against Israel's existence, and trying to uh, promote an Islamic Shia state in Lebanon. Um, Hezbollah has its own interests here, too. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's much more than that. But one of the things that we're seeing right now, and one of the reasons that Iran is so interested in seeing strategic missiles being transferred to Hezbollah, uh, not just in the past week, but since July 2006, uh, is so that Hezbollah has this capability. From Iran and Hezbollah's perspective, by the way, you know, July 2006, the message isn't, you know, uh, you know, Israel did pretty good with one arm tied behind its back. They feel that they bloodied Israel pretty good. They're the first ones to do it. No state did it, but Hezbollah did it. And the Israelis pretty much agreed. Now, the Israelis have retrained, and they're, I think, much, much more prepared right now. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it's a very difficult situation to respond to um, thousands of missiles, conceivably, being fired at Israel. Like a denial of service attack on computers, if you send enough messages at once, you can overwhelm. If you send enough rockets at, one, at once, you can overwhelm even the Israeli anti-missile systems. Um, so it, it is very complicated. If, if I could just add uh, to what uh, Matt said. If you remember, at the end of the 2006 war, Nasrallah said famously, had I known that you know, the, the kidnapping that led to the war uh, would have had that 
you know, uh, that result, I, I wouldn't, we wouldn't have done it. They, I, I agree that I, they, they, I think they feel they did reasonably well against the Israelis, but at a great cost uh, to their, to their um, uh, you know, domestic uh, you know, support base. And I, as a result, I think um, Hezbollah will, will face a dilemma in the event of an Israeli strike. On the one hand, they are, by inclination, I think they would like to strike, and they will be under great pressure from Iran to strike. But they will want to do so in a way that does not jeopardize um, and, and uh, you know, a repeat of uh, 2006. So I think what they will be inclined to do, I, I don't know if it would work out this way, is to try to split the difference, find a way, maybe respond with rockets across the border on a token basis, not enough to cause an all-out Israeli response, but enough to be able to say that they've launched a few rockets off while supporting Iranian operations overseas, terrorist operations overseas against Israeli um, diplomatic uh, or, or other tourist uh, kind of sites. So in, in the way that they could say to Iran, we are fulfilling our obligation as, as an ally and, and we are you know, acting in accordance, you know, that the Khamenei is our, is our uh, uh, marja and, and, and we follow his you know, guidance on, on policy issues, but we are also safeguarding our viability as an organization in, in Lebanon uh, in order to continue the resistance against Israel. So I think there might be ways for them to split the difference that doesn't necessarily lead to an all-out war against Israel across the border, but enables them to conduct operations overseas in support of Iranian objectives and their own objectives as well. So we have just a few more minutes. So why don't we just take two more questions uh, that, uh, together, and then we'll, uh, the panelists will answer them in turn. So uh, go ahead. So, so up front here. Hi, Tom Siegel. Uh, how much does Hezbollah's involvement in Syria right now and reports of dissatisfaction domestically play into their calculus and how they would re potentially respond and, and bringing Lebanon into a, uh, a period. Does that further sort of possibly uh, reduce their, their response, as you were saying, Michael? Uh, thank you. And then b before, you, before you answer that, uh, I think, Harold, did you have a question as well? So let's go to Harold in the back. What influence does Russia have in Iran, in particular to its nuclear development? Okay, so my question. I'll, I'll, start. Start, I'll start with the first, the first question. I mean, you know, one thing that, you know, watching the Israelis, um, you know, in, in 2006 there was a lot of, you know, there were some calls in Israel for Israel not just to strike at Hezbollah, but Syria as well, because they were kind of um, facilitators for Hezbollah, and, and they, were, they were enablers. Um, and, and Israel was very reluctant to fight a two-front war, um, e even as capable as the Israeli military is. They didn't want to fight a two-front war if they didn't have to. And that also has come up at the times when they were dealing with um, Gaza and there were rockets across the northern border. I think Hezbollah, the same thing goes for Hezbollah. Right now, they are involved in a, in, in a very... The biggest fight they've been involved in, certainly since 2006, and, 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 and maybe, the, maybe even the biggest fight ever. And... You know, I, I, I don't know how much credibility I assign to reports that they are, they are thousands, many thousands of Hezbollah fighters in, in Syria, but the numbers are significant because we know the numbers that are, you know, number of funerals that they're holding are significant, um, you know, in the scores, you know, so far, maybe more. Yeah. Um, so, so the point is, you know, this is a, a, an additional factor which I think weighs on their decision to not do something that would open up a front with Israel. Maybe operate overseas, and anyhow, it's, it's different people within the organization. They have the uh, kind of they have a overseas operations arm, Islamic Jihad organization, um, which is separate from their you know kind of conventional fighting for, or you know uh, uh, unconventional fighting force that would fight uh, against an Israeli invasion. So they can handle overseas operations while doing stuff in Syria. But you know, I don't think they would want to f deal with the Israeli military on the ground in South Lebanon while they have thousands of people in Syria as well. They just don't have that large a trained fighting force. Um, so I, I, I think that would further um, weigh on their you know, minds, that, that consideration. I'll just add, I'll, I'll leave the, the Harold's question for Patrick, but you know, last week Nasrallah gave uh, a speech. It was scheduled to be a few days later, and he moved it up, and the entire speech was clearly for uh, domestic consumption explaining the involvement in Syria in defensive terms. Hezbollah was trying to reframe itself as resistance. It was being uh, criticized for being on the offensive, and an offensive not against Israel, and on the offensive on the side of uh, a butcher uh, who is targeting fellow Muslims. I mean, the, the weapons of, quote-unquote, resistance meant for Israel, targeting fellow... It just wasn't looking very good at all. 
Um, and he moved this up because he felt the need to do it. And he explained it in terms of defending fellow Shia, defending Lebanese who happened to live on the Syrian side of the border, defending a particularly important Shia shrine that parenthetically Hezbollah has used as a place for operational meetings, including the final meeting before the Kobar Towers bombing, but that's another story. Read chapter 8 of the book. <laughs> um, but, uh, and this doesn't happen in a vacuum. This, is, this, is, this, this challenge to Hezbollah's stance and credibility and some sense of self, its challenge to its uh, position at home, is bigger than anything it's ever seen before. But it comes on the heels of the indictment by the UN Special Tribunal for Lebanon of four Hezbollah people, including the head of the Islamic Jihad organization and the militia for the assassination of Rafi Kariri. It comes on the heels of the 2008 takeover of downtown Beirut and the Shouf Mountains, where Hezbollah literally turned its weapons of resistance only against Israel, against fellow Lebanese, and against the July 2006 war, which, as Mike said, you know, cost them tremendous uh, support at home because it was basically a war that neither Israel nor Lebanon wanted, but were both dragged into uh, by, by Lebanon. So when Hezbollah tries to depict itself as Lebanese first, and Lebanese, not Shia Lebanese, first, it's a really hard time, and being the resistance defenders against the Israeli aggression has a really hard time. In its latest statement, in his latest statement, Nasrallah, just the other day, one of his big statements was, Hezbollah is now going to be supporting Palestinian groups coming from Syria to uh, free the occupied Golan Heights from the Israelis. Like he's creatively trying to find ways to make Hezbollah the resistance organization it once was in the context of Syria. And there's no way he's going to do it. It's costing him tremendous legitimacy at home. Oh, we, got a ni- we got a nice study outside about, by a former Russian diplomat about Russian-Iranian relations. And well, one of the comments that he makes is that there, there's a, a, a rich menu of things that Russia and Iran are interested in with each other. Uh, and that, frankly, the nuclear issue is not high on the agenda for either one with regard to the other. And Russia's influence on the nuclear issue is uh, – Russia's stance on the nuclear issue is primarily a product of Russian relations with the United States. And how does Russia see its position on the Iran nuclear matter playing in its relations with the United States? And the position that Russia takes on the Iran nuclear issue is important to the United States primarily because that helps shape opinion in large parts of the world which are not necessarily that well disposed towards the United States. Uh, And so if the Russians sign on, uh, the Chinese are going to too. And then we, we can do more. Uh, we can do more not only at the United Nations, we can do more at persuading all kinds of countries that don't really particularly care about this issue, you know, the Argentinas, the Malaysias of the world, uh, that there really is a broad international consensus about this matter, and that's why they should move on it. Uh, so uh, Russia's stance makes a difference, uh, but not primarily because of its influence uh, in Iran. And by the way, the Iranians have been remarkably disrespectful of the Russians on a number of occasions and have done a really good job at annoying Moscow.